uh, uh, Monday Thursday service. Thank you to all of you who uh, participated in making that a um, meaningful preparation for Easter morning. And then this morning, our uh, Easter sunrise service, Rachel did a great job of leading us in worship, and Bob Horning, uh, um, creative, um, inspired meditation, and a big thanks to the kitchen committee for um, blessing us with um, uh, breakfast. And now here we are, the uh, high point of the Christian year. I wish it um, didn't come and go so quickly, but uh, we make the most of it in this morning together. Just several things to highlight. Pastoral team meets on Monday evening uh, this week, and Finance Committee will be joining us at 8 um, for some um, shared agenda, giving counsel to pastoral team. And then just to note that today is the final day to return the ballots um, that uh, were in your bulletins two weeks ago, inviting you to respond to the recommendation to extend Dot Leatherman's term an additional year. And extra ballots are on the um, library, the library shelf. A, um, another um, matter to um, Add to the prayer list, in addition to the ones that are here, uh, Barbara Goodwin um, spent uh, several days in the hospital this week with um, lung infection, but uh, she's grateful to be back home, and let's uh, continue to be in prayer for, um, for Barbara. So today, uh, Lillian has our story of sensing God's presence, and where is Lillian? See, there she is. <laughs> Lillian, a story of sensing God's presence. When Harvey was pastor and dairy farmer, there just wasn't enough time to prepare for the coming winter. We had a wood-burning stove. It was August, and no wood cut. One Saturday, a Sunday school class took off from their regular routines and cut the complete winter supply of wood for their pastor. I sensed God's presence in their generosity. And recently, recently I sensed God's presence in the Thursday evening service here at Conestoga. Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Thank you, Lillian. Let's go to prayer together. Well, Lord God, we uh, thank you for that reality that though you were pierced and crucified, it was motivated by your love for us and your obedience to the Father. And we are so grateful that we are the recipients of resurrection power and resurrection promise. And as we um, experience the dark times and the shadows of life, we thank you that um, we also know that it has earned us, your resurrection has earned us uh, salvation and safety and promise and shared glory. Thank you for um, Harvey and Lillian's um, a ministry for decades in this congregation, 40 years, I believe, an active uh, role in leadership, and now a continued uh, ministry of blessing. And I um, thank you that um, though there were hard times, especially in that generation when persons were called out into leadership and uh, not compensated, but you protected Harvey and Lillian and uh, showed up through... Um, their faithfulness and through the generosity in other ways of the congregation to sustain them. And we know that each one of us who serves you um, as you call will uh, experience an eternal reward in addition to being able to testify of your faithfulness on this side of glory. Thank you that um, um, persons in our congregation who have been crying out to you in times of need have experienced your resurrection power even through the challenging times. Thank you that Barbara has returned home. And we pray that she would continue to sense your blessing. Thank you that Lamar and Lausanne 
um, that Lamar did not experience uh, permanent damage with this blood clot in his lung. And we do pray for safety as they fly home from Europe tomorrow. Thank you that um, uh, Ron is able to um, again be with us. And uh, we praise you for um, resurrection power that flows through our bodies um, that uh, brings about healing and renewal of strength. Thank you that uh, Howard Moss, um, with his symptoms this week, did not experience a heart attack, but um, um, is um, going through additional tests, and we pray for clarity and stabilization, returning Howard to full strength. Thank you that Larry Bush was able to return to work this past week after battling the flu, and that he's with us this morning. We pray for a return to full vitality and, and health. We're grateful that our offerings and our dollars join our witness in being multiplied by your spirit. We're grateful that we can support MCUSA in the Corinthian plan that minority pastors and um, other um, mission workers can support their families through our partnership um, in this um, MCUSA ministry. And we do pray that you multiply our witness and that you multiply our giving to impact the world with a witness of resurrection power in the name of Jesus. Amen. your blue worship hymnals and turn to number 283. And while we sing this song, I'm going to ask for my worship team to come back up again. And um, we're going to sing the Hear the Bells Ringing song. So if you can come up while we're singing this song and, and find your music. And Matt, when this song is over, maybe you can just put the screen down for that song. Got it? Okay. Number 283, let's stand to sing. Christ who left his home in glory.
the bells ringing, they're singing that we can be born again. find the word of the Lord in your bulletins but um, uh, before you um, before we read this word of the Lord together uh, turn to your neighbor and declare he is risen and shake one another's hand or give some word of greeting <laughs> Amen. The Lord is risen. Risen indeed. Oh, stay standing. Find the uh, insert, the John 20, 10 to 18, um, word of the Lord. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she shared, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? The man had taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have been. At this, she turned around and, and, and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. 
And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and, and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord together. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Brothers and sisters, the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Empty tombs. Empty tombs are really hard to comprehend. It just isn't part of the normal. Not what one expects. It's outside of the frame of reference. We acknowledged a number of weeks ago in the message from Lazarus, we acknowledged that death is offensive and death is hard to comprehend. But it's still, for any of us who have lived any length of time, it still is what we expect of things. It sometimes is not what we expect in its timing. But we know that in the frame of reference of how things go, that death is within the frame of normal. An empty tomb? That's, that's, that's hard to comprehend. In the verses prior to the ones that we read in uh, chapter 20, we're told that Mary Magdalene in the dark went to the tomb and she discovers that the stone is rolled back. It doesn't tell us there that she looks in and sees that Jesus' body is gone. But in the next verse, it says she runs back and she tells the disciples, someone has stolen away the body of our Lord and I don't know where they've taken him. So she must have looked in and realized it wasn't just that the stone was removed, the tomb was empty. But she doesn't comprehend its meaning. And it, we're told that the disciples, Peter and John, run when Mary gives this news. And we're told that John is the faster runner because he gets there first. But he stands outside the tomb. But when Peter arrives, typical with his personality, he boldly goes right in to the empty tomb and discovers the reality. But they don't comprehend either. Empty tombs are... Hard to comprehend. So the disciples are confused. They're afraid. They're bewildered. And the scriptures tell us they go back to their homes. Mary, on the other hand, she hangs around. She stays there. and She's weeping, the scriptures tell us. This is a perplexing time, a heart-wrenching time. It's hard to see the depth of the meaning of an empty tomb. Peter, when he runs in or goes into the tomb, you know, what he testifies to and therefore what gets recorded is he sees the literal. He describes afterwards, well, the strips of cloth were there and they were folded 
and they were at a separate place from the linen. Kind of inconsequential details. Had he really comprehended the resurrection? He's seeing the literal, and he's describing the literal of what he sees. Yeah, the cloth, it, was, it, was, it wasn't around the body of Jesus any longer. It was folded, and it was over here, and over here was, was, was the linen. Now, it does tell us that John sees enough to have his faith stirred. He, he believed. John comprehended at a deeper level. He saw somehow the deeper reality of the impact. Mary, she sees the empty tomb, but doesn't comprehend initially. She sees a missing body. Verse 13. We're told also in verse 13 she sees angels. Now every place else in the scriptures where someone encounters an angel, they're terrified. And one of the other gospel writers records that um, the encounter with the angels terrified the disciples. But here, when Mary encounters the two angels, she doesn't seem terrified. What she sees is a potential source of information. She doesn't comprehend the depth of what actually happened. She sees a source of information. Can you tell me where they've placed the body of my Lord? And then she turns around and she sees Jesus, but she doesn't see him. What she sees is a gardener. I wonder how many times um, in our life, as we look back on it, we recognize that God did something significant. God did something dramatic. And initially, maybe we had hints that God was at work. Maybe we were, we were clueless. But is it not true that for many of us as well, we look back over life and we acknowledge God was at work and we maybe comprehended it, but we really didn't comprehend it fully. We really didn't fully see God at work. We'll get a little later to the recognition, praise God, God is persistent, <laughs> such that when we look back, many of us now can comprehend in a deeper way what was really going on that we didn't fully understand at the time. Praise God. God is persistent. But now in the story we're simply recognizing these moves of God, this empty tomb, it's hard to comprehend. In the, uh, East, the sunrise service this morning, uh, Bob Horning uh, recognized that it's in John chapter 20, verse 20, that um, it says the disciples, when they truly see the risen Christ, they're overjoyed and they see. And Bob shared he had never seen it before. I never saw it before. The delight that it's in chapter 20, verse 20, that they get 2020 vision that they really comprehend what has truly happened. I've had numerous times in my life where I didn't fully see and comprehend. I shared in um, the Sunday school class a number of weeks ago, I believe uh, some of my... Um, uh, deep um, seated sense of inferiority when I was young that God uh, finally healed within me in my 40s um, that plagued me from little on up. I believe at least some of that was rooted in the reality that the, the um, nurses or whoever would come into schools, I don't know if I was absent in grade one and grade two, but it wasn't until grade three that they discovered that I had profoundly bad eyesight. Um, such that even if I was seated in the, in the front row, I couldn't comprehend what a teacher was writing on the blackboard. And so I grew up in those early years 
with a profound sense that I was stupid. It wasn't until in my 40s that God healed me of that. That deep sense of inferiority. Other people around me were comprehending what was going on, and I was clueless. And I know that, you know, this is, this is one of the ways where God fulfills his word and turns things on their head, even though it gave me a profound sense of inadequacy, it also sharpened my skills of paying attention to what other people around me seem to know and kind of going along with it. it and that's been a helpful art to have learned. But um, I had this profound sense of inferiority because everybody else seemed to comprehend and I didn't and but it also then developed this ability in me to pretend, which is not a good habit to have. Pretend you know what you don't know. God needed to break me of that throughout life. Well, why am I sharing that? Because we're talking about what we see. And I can remember um, now, I can remember all these years later, the first day that I was given glasses and the school bus dropped us kids off at the end of the lane. And if you know um, where I grew up, south of south here in the valley, the, the school bus drops you off and you walk up the lane and then you crest the hill to go down in the valley where the farm property was and way up behind is the Welsh Mountain where Cindy and I now live. And I remember cresting the hill. I can still recall it. I can feel it in my body. The first time with glasses, I crested the hill and I stopped and I looked because I could see the mountain in a way I'd never been able to see before. It was just this, it was just this blur of green. And it was a profound capacity of, wow, look what I can see. And I remember climbing that evening up the, up the um, ladder into the haymow to throw down hay bales and again being profoundly impacted as I'm climbing that right here with the hay bales right in front of me, I could literally see the points of the, um, of the little pieces of the hay that had been cut and severed and put into the, be into the hay bales, just being profoundly in awe. The things that I had been able to see but not really now I could see. Andy asked us in Sunday school this morning, you know, how has resurrection power impacted your life? And we gave testimony. He wasn't framing it around what we can see, but it was a similar kind of thing, a recognition that the Holy Spirit, the resurrection power within us, gives us the capacity to comprehend things and to see things and to have encountered things and to know things that we look back over life and we know beyond a shadow of a doubt we would not be there but for resurrection power. And I shared that confidence is one of those realities. When I first started preaching as a 20-year-old kid, I would get physically sick, literally. I, my nose would bleed beforehand. I won't describe the other symptoms of the body, because it... <laughs> but, but literally, I would get sick. I was a mess. Profound sense of inadequacy and inferiority. Is it not true that even today, sometimes, we realize that, you know, our, our sight is blurred and, you know, I sometimes, um, I go, you know, to a, a, a wash basin, I splash water on my face so that sight is restored. I want to see sharply. I hope every one of us in this room can testify to the reality that in a spiritual sense, though the empty tomb is hard to comprehend, we have the capacity to see the truth of it better than we did 10 years ago, 
better than 20 years ago, better than 30 years ago. And if periodically we've got to take cold water and splash it on our soul to comprehend it again, well, don't worry about it. Praise God for cold water that wakes us up. Those kind of pa moments where the truth of resurrection glory and its impact in our lives settles in in a fresh new way. And I invite us just to uh, be grateful, to rejoice in this day, and to be witnesses of Jesus. That's been the theme of our Lenten journey. What have we witnessed? Today we're recognizing witnessing to the empty tomb. What have we witnessed? What have we witnessed that we might testify to? So the second thing I lift out is when we yearn to see Jesus, he will reveal himself to us. When we yearn to know him, when we yearn to see him, he will. He will come to us. We see Mary hanging around the tomb. Can't comprehend. She knows the tomb is empty. She yearns to connect with her Lord. She wants to honor him. And in that yearning, Jesus comes and reveals himself. Mary. Mary. It's like the prodigal son story. You know, in that story that Jesus told, uh, we all know that uh, the earthly father of the prodigal son is a picture of our heavenly father. And a profound countercultural image that Jesus was declaring, a culture that understood the heavenly father as an angry tyrant, a judge. And Jesus pictures the father, our heavenly father, as sitting on the porch, waiting, yearning for the son to come home, yearning. And when finally the son turns and returns, turns and returns, this incredible picture of the father getting off of the porch and running to meet the son. Absolutely, profoundly countercultural. Not only for a physical earthly father in that culture, but profoundly countercultural in what Jesus was declaring about the Father God. He runs to embrace us. So Easter morning, I like to picture it as God running with arms open to meet his sons and his daughters who have seen because they yearned to know the truth of Jesus. For Thomas, you know, he placed his hands in the open side and put his fingers in the nail-pierced hands. For Mary, it was the pronouncing of her name. I never heard Jesus say my name. I never heard Jesus say Bob. But when I yearned to know Jesus, he found me. And I knew that he had found me. I knew he was speaking to me. I knew he was drawing me towards himself. It would be wonderful if we had time to hear everybody's story in this place. How you knew God was speaking to you. How you knew God was calling you. How did he reveal himself to you? Was it through his written word? Was it through a testimony? Was it through a song? Was it through an encounter out in creation? Was it just a drawing of the heart? Was it a deep conviction of your sinfulness? And light broke through? Multitudes of ways. But here's what we declare. When we yearn to know Jesus, he will reveal himself to us. For Paul, the apostle, was dramatic. 
For Timothy, he would hung around his mother and his grandmother's knee, and he knew from little on up. God drew them both in. The, the scriptures uh, tell us that um, uh, the story of God trying to get people's attention to understand that something dramatic had happened included two earthquakes. Matthew chapter 27 says there was an earthquake at his death and the centurion believed because the earth shook under his feet. Matthew 28 says there was an earthquake at the point of the resurrection when the angel came down and rolled the stone away. Well, earthquakes, we now know, they're the result of, you know, the immense pressure that is in the earth and the plates of rocks that, you know, the pressure gets so great that at some point the rocks shift. And then the whole surface of the earth above, those shifting plates, quakes. Twice in these moments in this story, the earth quaked. And I'd like to believe it's God having the earth declare the reality that everything has changed. The plates have shifted. Things are not going to be the same. The Old Testament way of the law has shifted, and now it's grace. Everything changed when the plates shifted on Easter morning. Earthquakes also get people's attention. Talk to anybody who's experienced an earthquake, they'll tell you the story. The more dramatic the earthquake, the more they remember where they were and how they experienced it. It gets people's attention. So once again, I'd like to believe this was God's way, these earthquakes, of declaring to people that were there at the time, pay attention, something dramatic is happening in the cosmic sense of spirituality. And you and I, we best rejoice in this day and be witnesses of him. The final thing we note from the text this morning is what Mary does. She goes back to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Our best witness is simply to tell others what we've experienced in Jesus. To tell the story of what we have witnessed. Doesn't need to be any more profound than that. That's the best declaration. Here's what Jesus has done for me to put it into words. It's our best witness. Now, in our small group, um, someone keeps good notes. And they uh, noted that uh, in preaching from one of the other Easter texts, maybe it was actually from this one, um, I pointed out the reality that um, Jesus tells you and I that we're more blessed when we believe because he says to those disciples, because you've seen me, it was after the Thomas experience, you have believed. Blessed are those who've not seen and yet believe. So there were points that I would envy the early disciples, because all that they encountered. But you and I are more blessed. We didn't physically, literally see Jesus. And yet, we have eyes to comprehend. And we believe. And as such, Jesus declares us blessed.
blessed. The empty tomb is hard to comprehend. Sometimes life circumstances even calls us in the dark times and the shadow times to, again, hardly be able to comprehend it. Let's just confess that to be true. But keep hanging around, yearning to find Jesus. Keep pursuing him the best you know how. And he will find you. Praise God, we can be witnesses to what we have seen. Amen? Amen.